uh, let us speak a bit about uh, minority rights. Of course, this is a topic which has been on the map, uh, uh, so to speak, for a long time, but it has acquired uh, uh, increased importance in recent decades, for instance, in the context of the 90s in the Balkans and in Africa. Uh, but of, of course, it is also uh, an issue of, of perennial importance in India. So, so first of all, since you have written extensively on the topic, what do we mean by uh, minority rights? Uh, the, the focus on minority rights was a product of a particular historical moment mm -hmm. and in the 1980s in India, and that was the rise of the religious right mm -hmm. and their attempt to forge India into a very unified and homogeneous nation state. Now, mm -hmm. India is a plural society, and the attempt to hammer minority cultures into a single mold particularly the Muslim minority, because that was the time they were targeting the Babri Masjid and remembering his uh, historical wrongs, which were performed by the Mughal rulers. Uh, there was need to talk about the rights of minorities to their own culture. Mm -hmm. So minority rights, in essence, are rights which are in addition to universal rights, universal fundamental rights, which mm -hmm. everybody possesses by virtue of being a citizen, but since minorities are more vulnerable to majoritarianism and to acts of discrimination, minority rights have come onto the agenda since yeah. the late 1980s, yes. And so in the Indian context, it's really uh, as late as in the 1980s that the notion uh, came to the fore and it was in the context of uh, religious minority rights. You see, minority rights first came onto the agenda in 1928, okay. when the leaders of the freedom struggle chartered, uh, created a draft constitution. Now, that was the time when these leaders tried to preempt the formation of separate electorates, which led to the partition of India. And they asked the party that represented the Muslims in India, who claimed to represent the Muslims in India, the Muslim League, to join in this exercise of constitution making. And the Muslim League um, laid a condition that we will do so if you accept separate electorates, which the Congress leadership was very, very reluctant to do. So instead, what they did was in the 1928, what came to be known as the Motilal Nehru constitutional draft, they incorporated provisions on minority rights, saying basically two things, that minorities will have the right to their religion. And this was obviously, um, this was obviously targeted at the fears of the Muslim minority, that in the events of independence, they would be steamrolled by a Hindu majority. Hindus are about 85% of the country after partition. And also to assure them that they would have the right to their own script, their own educational institutions, and their own cultural practices. So it goes back to 1928. It was incorporated in the Constitution minority rights to their culture, to their separate educational institution, which is Article 30 of the Fundamental Rights Chapter. But the need to reinforce minority rights really comes up in the mid-1980s, mm -hmm. when a very, very big movement was building up um, in favor of a majoritarian nation state. Mm -hmm. and, that many of us to write on this. Yes, yes. And, and why uh, specifically the 1980s? What was the political and cultural context of the time which, which put uh, again this notion on the map in the Indian context? Well, two or three things. One was the uh, demise of what had come to be known as the Congress system. The Indian mm -hmm. National Congress had been ruling for a majority of the years following independence since 1947. And um, in the aftermath of the imposition of the emergency by Prime Minister Indira Gandhi in the 70s and then her death in 1984, uh, they were, um, they, there was a vacuum, and this vacuum was sought to be filled in by the religious right mm -hmm. and its attendant bodies by focusing on a specific mosque that had been built by the Emperor Babur in the 9th, 17th century and claiming that this mosque had been built on the birthplace of a Hindu god and that the temple should be resurrected. Now, in the process, Muslims were being targeted. Mm 
They mm-hmm. were being targeted by the public and by the practices. And there was an atmosphere of extreme chauvinism and impatience in India in the 1980s with the cultural practices of particularly the Muslim community, but also the Christian community. So, um, you know, a few of us took up this challenge of arguing that minority rights are very much a part of democracy. Mm-hmm. And, and in your, and, and, uh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 I, I, uh, please. Yeah, no, and, and so in the context of your work, you, uh, you know, you have seen and you have argued that uh, secularism is somehow one of the devices through which you can somehow uh, ensure the protection of uh, minority rights. So why is it the case in general, and more specifically in the, in the Indian context? I mean, how does it work and, and how, did, how did it come to be about? You see, intellectual debate in India and the political debate in India in the 1980s, following a rather important decision of the Supreme Court on the rights of Muslim women to, uh, to maintenance, had sparked off an entire series of anxieties whether secularism will work in India, mm-hmm. um, given the fact that India is a highly religious society, and that secularism has not really led to staving off communal rights, you know, rights against minorities, or violence between the two communities. Now, in this context, uh, anxieties about secularism, uh, I, I was of the opinion there was need to strengthen secularism by going back to the antecedent moral principles that inform secularism. And in that work, which was published in 1999, I argue that secularism is not a standalone concept. It's not a concept that is autonomous. Secularism, at least as it has been understood in India, derives from the basic fundamental presupposition of equality. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only problem was that equality, if you understand in the purely formal sense, <coughs> excuse me, then you tend to forget the background inequalities in society. But if once you take these background inequalities into consideration, then the need for instituting protections for minorities uh, emerges as a natural corollary of equality. So what I did suggest was there is need to relocate secularism in the principle of democracy and in the principle of equality which is the organizing principle of democracy. And if we start thinking through the intricacies of the principle of equality, then substantive equality does mean that you recognize that some people have more needs because they are differentially placed in society, they are unequally placed in society. In effect, what substantive equality tells us that differently situated people must be treated unequally. Mm-hmm. So that was the idea that if you start talking from the vantage point of equality, then secularism obviously means that vulnerable groups should be protected, that minority rights becomes a part of the secular con- uh, principle. Uh, and so, so this doing... notion of secularism is equality of all religions is a very distinctive Indian contribution to the debate on secularism. Mm-hmm. And this was actually <coughs> constituted by Mahatma Gandhi when mm-hmm. he set out to create a national movement in the 1920s. All religions are equal. And that was the idea that, that I took up and talked about the complexities in the concept of equality. And, and precisely, you, you just mentioned that this uh, this understanding of secularism is, uh, uh, is 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 quite specific to the Indian context. And so, if you had to compare uh, the notion of secularism in the in the Indian context and uh, how it, it you know it unfolded in the more European or U.S. context, what would be the points of uh, uh, of difference and and the similarities for for the audience to understand uh, what's at stake here? Uh, There are basically two kinds of differences. Unlike the United States, Mm -hmm. where the wall of separation thesis uh, kept the state away from uh, religion, in India, uh, the uh, the state could not stay away from religion because the source of much, much injustice lay in religion, lay in the way religions have been created as a formal doctrine of status. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the state had to interfere 
in order to eradicate uh, practices that were uh, inimical, that ran against the fundamental principles of the Constitution, they ran against freedom, they ran against mm -hmm. justice, they ran against equality. Now, if the state cannot stay away from religions, then obviously secularism has to work out. Does it stay away from all religions? Does it stay away from religions on matters of, of principle? And what are the ways in which the state stays away? In the United States, on the other hand, there is this strict separation, wall of separation yeah. between the state and religion. In Europe, on the other hand, the task was made much easier in the 17th and the 18th century okay. when John Locke talks about his toleration principle. Because secularism is a political doctrine, and in fact, secularism is not widely used in Europe, it's toleration. Yes. Uh, as a political doctrine, this presupposed the secularization of society, which began with the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. Unlike the um, European experience, however, whether it was Turkey under Kemal Atatürk or India after 1947, we did not have a, we still do not have a secularized society. We have a society in which religion plays a very important role in marriages, in the way people conduct their everyday affairs. Now, in such a society, is secularism appropriate? And I think this was, uh, you see, there were two ways of dealing with it. Kamal Ataturk uh, located secularism in a religious society, but when it came to the leadership of the Indian um, of the of the Indian government and of the constitution makers, particularly the first prime minister of India, Nehru, he was very very conscious of the need to defend India's pluralism. So mm -hmm. religion was recognized, and in his first convocation address that he gave after becoming prime minister at the Aligarh Muslim University, he said it is not easy to find a good Hindi word for secularism, but it does not mean absence of religion. What it means is that all religions should be treated equally, and the state shall not uh, associate itself with any religion. So, so, so when, when, that was the distinction. Yeah, yes, and it's important because very often you see when we use concepts, we 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 we, we run the, the the risk of thinking that uh, uh, the, the concept has the same meaning uh, in different cultures, but very often it's not the case. So when when you talk about secularism in the Indian context, we shouldn't really think about uh, division of state and religion. It's more about uh, the state calling upon this notion as a way to try to somehow equalize. Uh, religions. Uh, yes, and also staying away from religion. The state does not proclaim a religion yes. as a state yeah. religion. The state does not adopt religious practices. Uh, it, it's that because of the partition of India and the fears of the Muslim community, Mm -hmm. that their um, practices would be ridden, ridden rough, shod over by majoritarianism. The first prime minister of India let them retain their uh, personal codes. Mm -hmm. And that has proved to be a bone of not only contention, it's also the source of gender injustice. I'm not saying the majority community is not guilty of injustice yeah. towards mm -hmm. its women, but mm -hmm. personal laws and the rights of women to get alimony or uh, the right of a woman to a monogamous marriage mm -hmm. is kind of always there is this polemic between personal code and a uniform civil code. Mm -hmm. um, so actually the Indian government did not practice uh, equidistant from all religion. It mm -hmm. reformed the Hindu religion to give rights to women, to give rights to the lower castes, mm -hmm. but it did not touch the Muslim religion. Mm -hmm. and the Christian religion. And this has created a lot of tension, not only for the religious right, but also for Democrats, because mm -hmm. it's very difficult to square gender injustice with the right of a woman to her cultural identity. This mm -hmm. is one of the perennial problems of cultural rights. Yeah. Uh, and so you, uh, in the context of your work, you approached the, and used the notion of secularism as a way to uh, not simply uh, and all the issue of uh, religious monetary rights, but also as a way to also think about uh, what you call substantive inequalities uh, in economic yes. terms, but in, in gender terms. So tell us a bit about this. How do we go from uh, secularism, minority rights, and tackling uh, substantive inequalities in terms of in economic terms and in gender terms? Uh, 
Yes, if you, I mean, if you look at the Supreme Court uh, decisions on secularism, the Supreme Court has inevitably ruled that secularism means equality of all religions. And this is a Gandhian principle, you know, it, 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 in Sanskrit it says sarav dharam sambhava. Now, if this is what secularism means, then, I mean, you're a political philosopher, mm -hmm. let's start looking at equality. Yeah. And when you start looking at equality, the principle of formal equality is quite hollow because it mm -hmm. is completely indifferent to background inequalities. Therefore, you have the whole issue of redistribution of economic assets from the mm -hmm. richer to the poorer sections of society in order to realize the principle of equality. Similarly, if secularism means equality, then let us look at substantive inequality equality and substantive equality tells us that there must be protection for vulnerable sections so let us give the minorities their cultural rights mm -hmm. the only problem is how to square with individual rights of the member within the group this is a problem that dodges all uh, theorizations on on uh, minority rights now i have argued that if the principle of substantive equality is going to govern the relationship between religious communities, then you sh it should also be used to regulate relationships within the religious community. Yeah. Yeah. That means the cultural rights cannot infringe the individual rights of the member within that community. It is an ideal position, but I think it, it is a position that probably squares with the principle of consistency, that if you have a general antecedent moral principle, then it must apply equally between cases. Mm -hmm. And, and yes. so, uh, how was your your I mean your your argument uh, on these issues? How was it received in the context of uh, intellectual and, and public debates in India and uh, beyond debates themselves? You know how uh, what has been the evolution uh, uh, of the situation since the uh, late 90s on these issues? Since the late 90s, you see, with the defeat of the religious right in the general elections of 2004, mm -hmm. the uh, heat has been lifted off discrimination against religious minorities. What, uh, but it so happened that in 2004, there was a major pogrom in the western area of Gujarat mm -hmm. of the Muslim minority. So we had to start asking again the question, how is it that basic human rights were not um, respected by the government in power. There is a basic human right not to be killed or not to be injured. That is the right of life, the right of liberty. Uh, but today there is a more substantive concern because a committee was set up by the government of India which showed that the Muslim community is the poorest in the country. It lacks access to opportunities. And now the debate really is how do you provide Muslim? Because you see, it seems to me on a general level, this entire debate on cultural rights somehow has reached its, its high point. It's kind of peaking out. Because in the process, what political theorists forgot to do was um, to take into consideration economic and social inequalities. Now, it is true that cultural inequalities cannot be collapsed into social and economic inequality, but it is also true that you cannot give people cultural rights and, lead, and let them lead a life which is marginal at best, you know, on, on a minimum wage or even uh, a lack of that wage. So there is, there has been a debate which was the result of this committee's recommendation. Mm -hmm. Should affirmative action be provided to the Muslim community? Now, this went against the belief of India's first prime minister, Pandit Nehru, because he felt that this was the cause of the partition of India in the first place. It would lead to ghettoization. But certainly the government has to take the claims of the, of the minorities into consideration when it comes to distribution of resources. Yes, mm -hmm. it, it is extremely important when it comes to jobs, when it comes to representation, when it comes to uh, living a life that is barely human. Mm -hmm. So I would say that to the debate on cultural rights and cultural protection, we now have to reinforce this debate by, uh, by a focus on social and economic rights. This is extremely important. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and of course, uh, in, political 
Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah. Just uh, uh, an aside. I mean, in the past weeks, I have been uh, reading your your work, and and it, it seems to me that you 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 are of two worlds. I mean, you know, as a political philosopher, as a political theorist, you are you are calling upon uh, the Western tradition, and then you are trying to somehow uh, use this. Western tradition and adapt it and adopt it for an Indian use as a, as an intellectual as a, as a man, if you will. How do you go back and forth and how do you go for an optimal use uh, in analytical terms, in normative terms of of these two traditions to understand and 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 you know put forward a, a progressive agenda in the Indian context? I mean, it's just a, a lot of curiosity. You know, I've just finished a book on contested secession. Um, I'm trying to figure out how, uh, how, how do you develop principles which uh, justify or do not justify a secessionist movement. Mm -hmm. When I started looking at the literature on secession, there were mainly liberals, liberals, uh, Western liberals. They were just not looking at troublesome cases, yeah. such mm -hmm. as Sudan, which we have faced with a major problem in Sudan, such as Kashmir such as Baluchistan, such as Bangladesh, which, are, which involve violence and which involve uh, third party intervention and which involves minorities within that region, which mm -hmm. seeks to secede. Now, it struck me that liberal theory, despite its universalistic pretensions, yes. does not really take into consideration some cases, and that is why liberals have been able to create fairly neat theories and principles of justification of empirical problems. But when you come to issues like Kashmir, there may be a right of secession, but this right of secession is counteracted by a number of other factors. Now, how do you square it? Now, what I want to do is not to knock... It, there is one way of going about the hegemony of liberalism, which very many post-colonial theorists tend to do, to say, you guys don't understand us, we will create our own theory. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that knowledge creation can never be completely authentically national or even emancipated from any kind of influence. We have been brought up in the liberal tradition. We were colonized for 200 years. What we need to do is to actually interrogate the limitations of liberal theory mm -hmm. and say, look, if you take into consideration these kind of factors, then your theory might look very different. Mm -hmm. So when you push back the self-imposed limits of liberalism, then you find that actually basically these limits have been imposed because liberals are not looking at contentious or, or, or troublesome cases. But the moment you introduce even nationalism, nationalism is such a messy phenomenon. Uh, but yet when liberals deal with nationalism, it flattens out the untidiness of nationalism because it would be all right, you're a national group, you want your own state, fine, go through a referendum, agree to a negotiated settlement, and then you know, deal with everything uh, across the table. Now, this doesn't happen in very many, uh, very many cases of, of secession or, say, ethnic conflict. Uh, you have people picking up the gun. How do you then look at these resolutions? So my attempt is to, um, let me put it this way. I think liberals ask the right questions. Because, after all, the great normative issues that they raise are as applicable to uh, Quebec as they are to Quetta or to, mm -hmm. or to Mumbai or to Delhi. Uh, what I do suggest is that these proposed resolutions have to be taken into account various cases which are very messy and which need sustained reflection. That is why I deal with Western theory. I think it's far too easy to renounce Western theory and just opt for your own theory or opt for colonial yeah. theories and just start attacking because that doesn't lead us anywhere. I think normative issues are important. They have to be after they have to be negotiated. Mm -hmm. So, so you are trying to find a, a, a kind of middle ground. Yes, if you yes, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, no, that would be yes. a way to, uh, to 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 put it, and uh, as a way to to to, to bridge uh, uh, theoretical concerns with uh, with uh, specific realities having to do with the context with which you did. Uh, yes, because uh, you see, if our interest in the theory 
-hmm. And we need normative theory because we do need norms to regulate our public life in very ethnically divided societies. Mm -hmm. Whether these societies are in South Asia or in Africa, you need norms. Unless you have norms, you're going to have politics uh, run, run rampant. You see, politics yeah. cannot be its own defense, its own jury, and its own judge. A politics has to be evaluated on the touchstone of norms. Now, I think liberal theory gives us the right norms, except that these norms, that when they work out, the gray areas in the norms are not fully worked up by liberal yeah. theorists. Mm -hmm. And sometimes looking at analytical philosophy, I feel, you know, it is a sense of a disquiet. Why is it so neat? Because human affairs are not so neat. They yeah. are mm -hmm. gray, they are messy, they are ugly. And mm -hmm. how do you deal with these issues? So mm -hmm. I thought perhaps if you interrogate liberal theory by introducing considerations that liberals don't take into account, um, which stem from concrete empirical cases, then you might have a very different series of proposition. Too many ifs and buts. Yeah. I mean, not so neat theories. Yeah. No, yeah, in fact, uh, last week we had a conversation with a colleague uh, uh, in the UK, and so the, in fact, he was uh, stressing the fact that, you know, the, the, in principle, the, it's all neat and, and it, you know, it's clean and so on and so on. But of course, in reality, it's much more complicated but I guess that as a, yeah. as a political theorist, as a philosopher, you, you have to try to bring the two things together. Otherwise, uh, you know, I, w w what's the point of neat philosophy if it doesn't really help you to really handle the messiness of, of, of life? Right, right. Uh, I think liberal theory is increasingly recognizing recognizing the importance of dealing with concrete cases. I mean, Will Kimlicka dealt with multiculturalism in Canada, and Thomas mm -hmm. Poge is dealing with inequality, and Peter Singer in his own utilitarian yeah. way is dealing with poverty. So there are very concrete issues that political philosophers are engaging with, mm -hmm. and I think uh, these are very important. Sometimes I find them a little Eurocentric. I find yeah. this whole debate on global justice a little Eurocentric. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't have any for uh, intellectuals from our part of the world yeah. because it's really about what the West owes uh, the, the post-colonial world. But you know, very exciting things are being done by taking into consideration the issues like poverty, issues like discrimination, mm -hmm. and issues like injustice and inequality. Mm -hmm. What would be... No, 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 you are right, actually. What would be a less Eurocentric... Uh, uh, Western-centric take on global justice, I mean, coming from, from uh, the non-Western world. What could be, in your view, what are, in your view, the issues which are uh, forgotten, which are not addressed uh, in this uh, um, Western-centric uh, take on global justice? I have contributed a piece to Alison Jagger's edited volume called Poge and his critics, uh, looking mm -hmm. at Thomas Poge's philosophy on global justice. And two things struck me. One was his notion of causality. You know, mm -hmm. where the West is responsible, then the West, then this ordinary citizen must uh, compensate the victims of injustice. So it's very clear when you have uh, farmer suicides in India, because that is due to the WTO, and WTO is dominated by the American uh, government. So American citizens have a uh, have, have a duty and obligation. But what about those cases where, um, which are the product of colonialism? I mean, troublesome cases like uh, Rwanda. You know, Rwanda, the Hutu and Tutsi um, enmity was a product of colonialism, as it was in many parts of Africa and Asia. Causality is a problem. I think any theory of causality runs into, any, into, into problems. Secondly, you know what, Thomas Poge talks of universalism, but he doesn't give any obligation, he doesn't grant any obligation of, to, the, to people in the post-colonial world, in the de less developed world, who are not precisely rich, but who are also not poor. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a way, I did ask him, I did point that out in that piece, and his answer was, well, you guys settle what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And then, the, then our question would be, can our uh, poor, poor, the global poor wait for citizens of affluent countries to recognize their obligation or their, or their uh, duty 
to uh, remedy the injustices of their own government. Because after all, the uh, justice is something that is realized through struggle. It's not something that is given on a platter by any government. Mm -hmm. And if that is so, then theories of global justice can only form the outer edge of any effort to realize justice. Ultimately, in the absence of a cosmopolitan uh, political institutional order, it is the national state that has to realize yes. justice. And for that, the poor people will have to organize. If the West gives, thinks it's responsible, it's very good. But ultimately, we cannot, our, our people cannot rely on the good intentions of Western liberals. I mean, I appreciate their theory. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a bit of a blind spot when it comes yeah. to the post to the world that yeah. they are theorizing about. No, no, I think you're right. So, so in a way, you argue that uh, somehow the, 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 the debates on global justice, uh, uh, you know, this all, uh, they are somehow portraying the non-West in two passive terms, and they don't really put forward the sense of agency, the sense of responsibility, which should be also at the core of uh, the non-Western world. Yes, I think so, that you've captured that pretty well, yeah. yes. That's because Im implicitly, very somehow... Uh, the, 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 the idea that the South is the victim and therefore that uh, uh, agency once again has to come from the developed countries and uh, but it is not really, uh, it shouldn't be the case, uh, it shouldn't be the only terms of the debate, right? Yes. I think the unintended, it's purely unintended, yes. the unintended result of global justice theories is to see the developing world or the poorer uh, were part of the world as consumers, either of injustice or of justice. And what yes. about this part of the world? I mean, I can't think of a single poor person who doesn't uh, exercise agency. There is no mm -hmm. one who doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Africa or or in South Asia, that aspect of agency is not recognized by global justice. And their response is very clear. We are not speaking to you guys. We are speaking to our own people. Mm -hmm. But if that is the case, then why are global? You know, yes. I mean, globality um, implies universality. And if it's universal for a universal theory of global justice, then you must make people in the post-colonial world also responsible for global poverty. Mm -hmm. That will not have a theory of causality, but that will work if people feel morally responsible for global poverty. So in, in a way you are saying that uh, somehow in the way uh, de uh, debates are being framed when it comes to global justice, there is also a form of, uh, although it's a, it's a, it's a well-intentioned one, uh, a form of paternalism. I think it's a form of self-critique. Oh, self it's okay. a form of self-critique, that is mm -hmm. very clear. It's a form of realizing the universal ambitions of liberal theory. Mm -hmm. But yes, unintendedly, it's a form of paternalism. I don't ascribe this to global justice yeah. philosophers, mm -hmm. but I think un the unintended consequence is paternalism. Yes, yeah, it, is. In, it is very much a white man's burden. Yeah, because in the end, it's, it's another way of not seeing the other and not really uh, recognizing the other as a full-fledged agent responsible actor who can also contribute uh, as much as uh... yes i mean what are they doing to ameliorate their own poverty um mm -hmm. i don't think enough attention has been given to that because global justice philosophers are in the business of extending Rawlsian theory of obligation of, of justice or the utilitarian um, concern with people not being unhappy and not looking at, uh, as questions of agency, you're quite right about it. Mm -hmm. I, I am a little concerned about that issue. Uh, uh, and you the other day we had a conference and, yeah, and there was an Indian philosopher who kept saying, we, and I asked her, who's the we? We are not a part of their theory, not yeah. people living in India. We, it's not we who are responsible. We are not in the picture at all. So I think global justice philosophy will have to be expanded a little to cover different kind of conditions and different kind of obligations uh, that people of the world have. Yeah, and but uh, don't you think that it's one yeah, but don't you think that uh, it is very often the tendency when we talk about justice to really uh, view the beneficiaries of of, uh, of a discourse of justice as as victims, you know, among nations, within nations, while well, well, in the end the goal is to really restitute a full sense and allow for the possibility of a full, of a full sense of agency for the people whom we want to benefit from justice. 
Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, to recognize people as passive recipients of obligation is a major moral mistake, I think. And it runs contrary to liberal theory, because liberal theory rests upon the notion of moral status of human beings. As I said, it's purely unintended, because it's a form of self-critique. Mm -hmm. But to a carping um, a critic from, the, uh, from this part of the world, it seems as if, you know, uh, we are not there. I mean, global poor are not there, we are not there. It's that kind of a situation. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think this is a this is a, a very very good point. And w well, what strikes me very often is that there is a, a lack of, of of reflexivity in how we we conceptualize these issues. I mean, on the one hand, you know, uh, I mean, you know, philosophers in the West, you know, uh, I think are, are well intentioned. On the other hand, they they do think and they do approach these issues in a way which is uh, maybe uh, self-critical, but not necessarily reflective. Yes, uh, not adequately uh, sensitive to uh, the uh, to the to the concerns of the developing world. There was a different tradition in Marxism. I mean, mm -hmm. if you remember, dependency theory had a number of scholars joining in from all over the world. But dependency theory had a very short shelf life. But mm -hmm. there was a certain coherence. There was a certain universality to the idea that there has been this injustice. A global justice philosophy will need to be expanded. Uh, by its by its formulators, and it would need to take into consideration the idea that you know if 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 every American citizen wants to give one dollar uh, or or not eat a burger with six slices of cheese and give that money to the uh, colonial world, that's fine. The only problem is we don't want missionaries, yeah. right? We want people who recognize. Um, you know, who recognize the fact that there are people out there who've been victimized by the international um, system. They are fighting. We have to contribute. And I think that kind of a task uh, is, is being done by global coalitions in global civil society. Now, there is very link up between philosophical theories of global justice and the literature on global civil society, the twain do, do not seem to meet at all. Yes. And I can't understand why. Because if you look at the whole issue of how the social protection for the informal sector came out with the agenda of even the Indian government 40 years after independence, you know, in, in the informal working class is 94% in India of the whole, entire working class. Indian government did not pay attention, did not give attention to this phenomenon. But there was this whole global coalition of women in informal sector, a week ago, which raised this issue. And they were doing it not because of causality or because it, as, as acts of recognizing their obligation towards global poor, as acts of solidarity. And yes. when you introduce solidarity, it's an old-fashioned Marxist term, but it captures a universality and reciprocity much if more effectively than, I think, the limitations of liberal theory. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions as a follow-up. Uh, uh, you know, also what strikes me in, in, uh, in Western uh, debates on, on global justice is that we really call upon a very, very narrow body of knowledge. It's essentially Western philosophy. And, and uh, a few weeks ago, we had a conversation with Professor Onuma, who has been uh, with a, an international lawyer from Japan who, who argues that, in fact, we should internationalize international law, which so far has been essentially uh, a European-American dialogue. And he was arguing that in the field of international law, we should call upon, you know, cultural and intellectual traditions coming from Asia, Southeast Asia, and so on and so on. So also, I mean, you know, uh, in intellectual terms, and of course it has political and policy consequences, you know, wouldn't it be better uh, to really call upon uh, intellectual traditions, you know, beyond the West to think about justice at the global level? I think so. The only problem is that, you know, the notions of justice are perhaps not reconcilable. Um, I remember an attempt by uh, Charles Taylor mm -hmm. to look at the discourse of human rights, you know, in, in the context of Theravada Buddhism. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was called to an unforced consensus on human rights. So he looked at the tradition of Buddhism and said, do away with rights. Let's look at the status of the individual in Buddhism. Now, it struck me that there was a methodological problem here. 
because in the West, human rights comes up as limits on the state, right? Mm -hmm. And individual autonomy in the name of individual autonomy. In Eastern traditions, as far as I know, I may be wrong, I'm not an expert on Eastern mm -hmm. tradition, but I do know in Hinduism and in Buddhism, limits on the state have to do with the king, you know, with the monarch's yeah. responsibility to a certain code of conduct. It may call it dharma, it may call it anything. The two traditions are strictly not compatible because in the latter case, the autonomy of the individual is not foregrounded. In mm -hmm. the Western tradition of individual rights, it is the autonomy of the individual. That is the main, ever since mm -hmm. Thomas Hobbes, I mean, yeah. of, of say, yeah. it is the individual who is important. I don't know, therefore, whether it will be possible to combine as traditions of justice, which rest on very different philosophical presuppositions, yeah. into a coherent body. Uh, what we could do is what, as I'm sure you know better than I do, mm -hmm. that um, start off with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and to talk in terms of political notions of justice. And um, because if you start squaring them with, um, with, with traditions in Buddhism or traditions in Islam or traditions in Hinduism, my idea is you will not get a very coherent picture. You might even get injustice according to yeah, yeah. contemporary yeah. conceptions. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, very often, you know, regular people, I mean, and this is the case uh, uh, in the non-West as in the, in the Western world, I mean, you know, regular people tend to somehow feel comfortable in, in, in traditions and they tend to identify with traditions. So, and, and very often, you know, uh, people who are more uh, in line with uh, the modern canon uh, tend to view traditions as uh, opposed to a progressive agenda. So, but how do you reconcile um, traditions and a progressive agenda so that in the end, you know, we don't have a, a progressive agenda which is, you know, mainly an elite agenda. I mean, is it a, is well, it a fair well, question or...? Uh, uh, no, no, it's, uh, it's completely fair. Uh, you know what is happening? There are two kinds of things happening on this front. One is there is very there is a very determined effort by Chinese philosophers, for instance, to rework Confucianism. You know, to yeah. rework the um, Joseph Chan in Hong Kong, for instance, has talked about how Confucius generates a theory of social justice. Um, in India, there is an idea of reconciling human rights with, with indigenous traditions. I don't know how far it will go, but certainly if you uh, focus on the dignity of human beings, but between ancient traditions and now, there is an entire historical period where you either have colonialism and these traditions of knowledge which are given to people but which become a part of our tradition. There are constitutions, there are international uh, documents, there are international uh, bodies, and there are international NGOs. Uh, I think in Ethics in Action, uh, when you guys edited yeah. um, the, the volume, the way in which international NGOs are setting the agenda for political action became very, very obvious. It became very, very important. So I don't even know if it's possible to resurrect an authentic sense of a tradition. This is what our tradition says. There are multiple interpretations of Islam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Islam is not the same as Sufism or, or not the same what it is to many uh, I mean, it's not the same in, in Shia, not the same in Sunni. There are multiple traditions. So I suppose some degree of hard work will have to be done to kind of privilege a tradition within the umbrella tradition, which will sit well with, with what is due to human beings. Let's start mm -hmm. off with that particular idea. Yeah. Yeah. No, because uh, you're, 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 you're right. I mean, actually, maybe we, we are focusing too much on tradition because uh, very often, in the end, you know, uh, people from from uh, from uh, all walks of life, uh, you know, while being uh, you know uh, part of, of of traditions, also have a strong sense of what is right and what is wrong and of their rights. Right. I think rights have become detached from any particular historical discourse and mm -hmm. become a part of everyday imagination. This is not only what has happened due to globalization, it was very much a part of our freedom struggle. It yes. was a part of our freedom struggle in South Asia, it was a part of the freedom struggle in Africa. When they were talking about rights, when they were talking about liberation, it becomes a part of your popular consciousness. 
Just to say a tradition originally emanated in the West, therefore it's not acceptable. Yeah, it's very difficult to distinguish what is called uh, invocation of tradition from very authoritarian agendas. So one, I don't know, one has to do hard work in this respect to avoid being called Eurocentric. Or, on the other hand, to uh, be called indigenous, between indige indigeneity and, and received wisdom. And they, these are not two separate categories. There was an exchange of ideas for 300, 400 years before the onset uh, of, of decolonization, which creates a certain popular understanding what people are owed. So how are you going to disentangle various strands of of, of, of received understanding from authentic understanding. I mean, I'm an Indian. I was born in post-independence yeah. India. And if you tell me, do I know of any authentic tradition? I don't. Yeah. I mean, of course, we don't have a book. We, we're not a people of a book in India. The Hindus are not. But even if there was, I would be likely more influenced by education, by what I yeah. read, by yeah. what I watch. Uh, rather than go back to some pristine tradition. That would mm. be frankly dishonest uh, on the yeah. part of those who uphold mm. tradition. You, you, you mentioned, and perhaps as a way to end our conversation, you mentioned earlier the notion of global civil society. Is our activists uh, in India involved, for instance, in the, in the World Social Forum? I mean, uh, uh... to a very large extent, yes. Uh, yes. There are some groups that are involved in the World Social Forum, and uh, they are making a significant contribution to the discourse on, for example, uh, uh, what is due to indigenous people, the tribals. Uh, that, mm -hmm. that is a very important way of looking at it. There is considerable breakthrough on the idea of what were the former untouchables, the Dalit question, because it's directly linking up with issues of racism. Uh, there, there is a lot of, as I've already said, there is a lot of focus on the unorganized sector, on women, mm -hmm. on issues of, of, of peace. I mean, this is important of global civil society. Yet there is also, I think, some form of disquiet that global civil society is dominated by a handful of NGOs that belong to the yeah. West who are not yeah. sufficiently uh, caring about the concerns. Yeah. But um, as long as it, you know, civil society only gives you a space where you can have multiple conversations, mm -hmm. nothing may come out of it, but it is important these conversations are held. And that is why I think global civil society is a very important development in our uh, global uh, life, in our globality. And it's also interrogating globalization. It's introducing a very important corrective into globalization. So perhaps one day somebody there will listen. One day? We, we, I mean, the entire... Yeah. 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 Go ahead, go ahead. The entire focus on social policy, which has occurred in the middle of globalization in many countries, including India, has stemmed from these coalitions, these networks that foreground the problems of poverty. Mm -hmm. That say that India cannot be a rising power if one third of its people are absolutely poor. <clears throat> the the uh, foregrounding of poverty or the fact that there is malnutrition does make the government sit up and listen. So there has been these um, uh, enactment of several laws which give the right to work, which give the right to information or the right to education. Much more needs to be done. But we see a commitment to social policy in the middle of a very globalizing, liberalizing state. And India is not alone in it. There are many other countries. Uh, South America is like that. So the, 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 ri yeah. the, the, the rising global status of India puts pressure back at home to have the government tackling I, this. So this is, this is a I good think, thing. I think so. I think so. I think the uh, global, uh, global civil society agenda, not all of it. I mean, global civil society is a plural space. You have chambers of commerce being represented there. But the let us call the Democratic Progressive Network, have put these issues squarely onto the agenda. Mm -hmm. And India doesn't want to be embarrassed yeah. um, by allegation that it is not very uh, just to its own people. Mm -hmm. They're on the agenda. Much more needs to be done. It's frankly inadequate. And there's one concern that strikes me um, that the problem, you know, poverty is today a big thing. The World Bank talks about it. UNESCO uh, talks about freedom from poverty as a human right. Mm 
it's very surprising, and you will understand this as a political philosopher, how the discourse of poverty has been emancipated from the discourse on equality. Yeah. I mean, no one talks about equality. Today you talk about sufficient carrianism, so give the poor some amount of money, call it cash transfers, and your obligations to the poor are, are um, discharged. Yeah. It seems to me that poverty is not an isolated phenomenon. It is a relative, it's a relate, it's a phenomenon of relationship. Now, as long and, and the objective of equality, and I think it strikes me, and this is again a problem I find in liberal theory, Ever since John Rawls, um, equality has be, uh, become collapsed into the issue of redistributive justice. Mm -hmm. Equality is much more than redistributive justice. Redistributive justice is a way of realizing equality. But equality has to be thought of in terms of um, enabling people to take their uh, position in the arena of discussion and make themselves be heard. I mean, you know, acquire moral status. But today, all the focus, whether international or national, it seems to be give them that much money, let them buy their, you know, reproduce themselves, and that's all we owe them. Mm -hmm. I think the poverty of the poverty discourse rests in detaching it from a, from an ambitious big idea of generating equality. Mm -hmm. well, and this we, is happening in India. Yeah, and uh, in a way, you see, it is per perhaps also happening in the U.S. You know, you, you could call the, the voucher syndrome. You know, we we just uh, give a, a little bit of money and, and that's it. I think it is uh, it it is a travesty of what we owe each other as human uh, beings. Absolutely. Is that all we owe the poor? Yeah. Because if poverty is a product of society, then surely we owe much more. And to just dismiss them with um, some dollars or some yeah. rupees or, uh, you know, these are important components. But unless we start relocating equality at the center of the political discourse, it seems to me the problems of this world are not going to be negotiated satisfactorily. Mm -hmm. That is what it seems to me. Mm -hmm.